Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Community Foundation on Expo training. It's the, the September 2023 edition. And as you're probably aware of, we have had similar training sessions throughout the year, March, earlier this year, in previous years. So we are always trying to, to bring to you the most up-to-date information on how to learn Nextflow flow and NF core tools. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here so we can discuss a bit about how the training session is going to be. So this is the NF core website, the nf-core.re. And you have all the information about this community foundation Explore training, right? So in this first session of today, we are going to focus on things that are related to how to use Nextflow. So before anything else, I will start giving you a about 30 minute talk about Nextflow and the background and what it is the, what is the tool, some information for people who not, doesn't know anything about Nextflow. And then I will start going through the training material that you that you can access by access you, you can check with training.nextflow.io and we're gonna use this basic Nextflow training workshop here. You have many sections here, right? We are not gonna cover all of them, but on the first day, we're going to check the introduction to Nextflow, how to set up your training environment, uh, the getting started, configuration, managing dependencies, and deployment scenarios. So all of these things, they are somewhat related to how to use Nextflow pipelines. So you found a pipeline on the internet, the Nextflow pipeline, you want to use it, you want to change something, you want to understand how it works, you want to change the configuration. These are the sections that we'll focus on, on providing you the skills and the knowledge to be able to use these pipelines. The second session, which is going to be tomorrow, we're going to get deeper into the theory, like what are Nextflow channels, what are Nextflow processes, what are Nextflow channel operators, channel factories, and, and all these things, right? We're also going to get into more detail about caching resume that will be briefly mentioned today, but we will, we will get into more detail tomorrow. And then we're going to start to, to write from scratch a proof of concept RNA seq pipeline in Nextflow with everything that we learned, right? On the third day, uh, Chris Hackard is going to uh, is going to join us, and we will talk about NF Core, NF Core tools, uh, NF Core both for users and for developers. This is going to be the third and last day of this foundational training, right? Uh, probably by the time it's over, you will already have some knowledge about Nextflow and NF Core and pipelines and using and writing and so on. And then we're going to have another training, so we can go here. On September 20th, we're going to have the hands-on Nextflow training. So this training, as the description says, is like a fast way to get up and running with Nextflow. If you already know Nextflow, it's been a while, you don't write your pipelines on the right or write Nextflow pipelines. You want to practice, you want to remember a few things, or you just finished the, the foundational training and you want to, 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 to have a challenge. This is the perfect training for you. And if you're really eager to learn to learning more advanced features, then we have at the end of the month, the community advanced training. So this one is a very, very interesting training. It's the first time we are going to, to offer this one. And I think it's very, very nice. If you don't think you are ready for that, it's fine, but I think it's worth a look. There are many interesting things that you will see uh, in this training, which, you, which will be at the end of the month, right? This one's gonna be September 19th, this one's September 20th. So now that I briefly like mentioned, talked about the training and everything else, even before we start using the training material, I would like to present a talk where we'll go through many concepts that I think are very interesting for you that will help you with the other sections, right? So if you don't know anything about Nextflow and, and you think that maybe you don't want to do the training because you really have no idea why Nextflow exists, that's a nice way to start. That's why I'm going to start with this talk. So here we are. I think that a very important keyword that is behind Nextflow and many other technologies that are related to Nextflow is open science. It's a, it's a very important, uh, it's, it's like a, you can call it a movement that we have today that a lot of people are trying to do open science or make, make or to make science open, more open, right? And I think that Nextflow is very important to, to achieve this goal. And there are many other keywords that I think that they come to mind when you think about open science, we can think about open source. So if you really want to have open science, it's important that you know what the softwares that you're using are doing. So in order to, 
to really be aware of your methodology and to to know exactly what is being done you know the parameters the options the versions when you call a function what that function really does it's very important to have access to the source code at some point for example i was using in my career a software that the documentation said it did one thing and we all believed it but at some point i, I went to check out the source code and actually it was not quite what was being said the methodology was different and this impacted the interpretation of the results in my study so having access to the source code of the technology you're using in your study it's very important and, and next law is open source just to make it clear here but it doesn't stop there like open data is also very important if you are using this amazing methodology that you master you know everything about it you don't know exactly what is the data that you're handling that's very dangerous you don't know how it was measured uh what this variable means what this other one means what's the unit of the measure and all these things so it's important to have open data also and you know if you have all these things you have like open source software open data everything of very nice quality documented it and everything you use next load to orchestrate that you also need an open community and a, a community of researchers and analysts and data scientists and so on where people interact and learn from each other so maybe i like the pipeline you wrote and i want to apply this pipeline to my data and it would be nice to give you feedback on what happened when I used to different data to a different species, to a different methodology after the pipeline and all these things. So this open community is very interesting. In the next law community and the NF core community in general, they are very, very open and very, very nice. If you join our Slacks and see the discussions that happen there, you see that all the time we are learning from each other and sharing pipelines and running pipelines and, and publishing papers mentioning these pipelines and learning from each other. It's very, very nice. So I just wanted to highlight the importance of open science and having open source software an open community and open data. So let's start talking about workflows. So what are workflows? So the idea of workflows or pipeline is basically to have an amount of data and you do a few things to this data. You have many steps where you do one thing to the data, then you do something else to the next, uh, you do something to a data, and then the result, you do something else with that, and the result of that, you do something else. So you have this workflow, many tasks that you want to do with some data. And genomics is no special uh, area when it comes to, to having workflows. You have workflows in many, many different fields. And Having said that, you, you can use Nextflow and other pipeline orchestrators or workflow orchestrators in all these different fields. It doesn't matter. The thing is, genomics is, is a bit particular in, in some uh, characteristics that makes it very challenging to, to write workflows. So one example, one, one example that I can give to you is that in some fields in, in data science in general, in machine learning, uh, you're going to have a tabular data, for example, a TSV, a table separated value with a lot of samples, with some columns, and that's what you have, one file. And this file usually, compared to genomics, it's very small. You can have a few gigabytes maybe, but that's it. Millions and millions of rows, and you have a few hundreds of megabytes or a few gigabytes. If you go to image processing, for example, machine learning with images, you, you're going to have lots of images, maybe a thousand millions of images, but these images are going to be short, like a few megabytes. In genomics, on the other hand, it's not rare that you will have a lot of samples that individually are very, very large. So you could have thousands of samples that each sample has a few gigabytes, for example. Or maybe you have different databases that you have to check. It's, it's a very heterogeneous uh, input for the workflows let's say you have you have data in different formats you have binary formats you have uh, databases you have reference files it's a very heterogeneous one and considering all these things um, among many other things that i didn't mention here it's very challenging to orchestrate genomics workflows in next flow was born to tackle this issue so a few other characteristics that you also have in this genomics workflows is that usually you have also a very heterogeneous set of software to use. So in the same pipeline, you could have a Python script to do something to your sample, and then you have an R script to do some analysis using some R library that you found, uh, an R package, and then you have a MATLAB script to do something else. Maybe you have some compiled programs. Maybe you have some custom scripts. So it's not like you use Python for everything, as it's relatively common in other fields. You actually have a very diverse and heterogeneous set of tools that you want to use. And if a 
pipeline orchestrator or a technology only supports uh, compiled programs or Python or R, you're in trouble because usually that's not what you have. And Nextflow supports this, right? Another thing is that usually you will have to, to, to take decisions on the fly. So maybe at some point, depending on the state of the data, you want to use a different software for the task or a different one, or you want to skip a step. And if you have to stay by the computer for weeks or months, waiting this moment to say yes or no, and then go to bed and then go back to say yes or no, this is going to be awful, right? So Nextflow has multiple features that allows you to not worry about that. So that when certain circumstances appear, Nextflow will, will, will do what you said, of course, but it will have the autonomy to take the decisions based on what you instructed it to, right? So here we have one example of a pipeline. Uh, it's a bioinformatics pipeline, right? You can check the publication. I have the reference here at the bottom. Every so we call this drawing a, a DAG, right? A directed a cyclic graph. So we have nodes, which are these circles, and we have this arrow, this oriented arrows showing the flow of the information, right? We can do a zoom here. So I just wanted to, to emphasize that in this pipeline specifically, we have 70 steps and over 50 custom scripts among many softwares and libraries. So if you zoom, you're going to see something like this. So you have this step, for example, which we have two inputs. And this step, it's going to produce a, an output that is going to go to two other steps, this first and this one here. And this one is going to produce three outputs, which are going to go to three different steps. So this can get very complicated, as you can see. And at some point, people realize that even if you have a software to, to, to help you orchestrate like a, a rudimentary software would say, but at some point they were trying with some basic technology. How can you try to make sure the, the steps are repeated? And actually what happens is that you get different results. So in this case, they tried the same pipeline with Amazon Linux, Debian Linux, and Mac OS. And as you can see, the results of the pipeline, they were different. So just by changing the operating system, you get different results. So this is the type of situation that Nexo was trying to tackle, like scientific reproducibility, right? I wanted not only to be able to repeat the same steps everywhere, but in a way that I get the same results. Because if I have some samples and if I run in my machine, I get an answer. If I run in your machine, I get a different answer. If I get run in the machine of the reviewer, I get a different answer. This doesn't work, right? So we need rep not only repeatability, but we need reproducibility. And this is the scenario where tools like Nextflow uh, arise. Uh, but even though it can seem challenging to, to achieve reproducibility, even repeatability, even being able to repeat the same steps is very, very hard, much more difficult than most people believe to, it to be. So in here, in this paper by Dr. Mangu, for example, you can see that among the research papers that they analyze in this, in this, in this manuscript, 28% of all the omic software resources, they were not accessible. So the authors mentioned they use something and you could not even find that because the resources were not available anymore. Among the ones that were available, they, even though you could find it, they were very difficult to install or they could not be installed at all. So we could not even repeat what the authors did or even in industry, we could not even repeat what some peer told us they did. Another paper here is to tackling this thing is, you know, first we tried to rebrand the analysis with the code and data provided by the authors but then we had to re-implement the whole method in a Python package. So historically, it's been very hard. It's been shown to be very hard to repeat the steps of some analysis. And even when you manage to do that, it's very difficult to reproduce the same results. And then I, I love this figure here. You know, it's very common for people who work with data science. And, and it's my case. I, I see myself here. When you read a new blog post or on Medium or something, or you see a new research paper doing this amazing thing with this amazing method, and one of the first things that come to mind is, I want to take this method and apply it to my data. I mean, they made, they made so many nice things with their data. I'm going to do amazing things with my data. But that's the tip of the iceberg. There are multiple things behind it, beneath it, that you don't even imagine. So maybe that method is very good for that particular case, in that specific data set they have, with the specific parameters that they chose and everything else. And actually, in my data, it's worse than the state-of-the-art method that I have used before. So there are many, many different things that are difficult to control, and we are not aware, usually, that are 
very important to achieve the result that we were told to, to exist, right? And it would be very nice if we, we could have a tool to manage all these things, all the parameters, versions, isolate an environment to make sure it's reproducible and install things for us and manage the, the updates and have documentation and everything isolated in a way that you can just give one command and everything is going to be downloaded, organized, and run for you. That would be amazing, right? Well, that's what Nextflow does. So Nextflow is clearly a software, as you saw. It's, it's, a, it's a program. It's a Python orchestrator. You download a program and you use this program to run Nextflow pipelines. But these pipelines, they are written in a language, which is the Nextflow language. It's a DSL, a domain-specific language, and we call it the Nextflow DSL. So we have this language. And it's built on top of Groovy. So if you're familiar with Groovy, a few things are going to feel familiar to you. But it's not required to know Groovy to write Nextflow DSL. So there are three primitives uh, when it comes to Nextflow DSL. The first one is processes. So processes here are represented with these blocks. They are basically functions. They represent every step in your pipeline. So if your pipeline, if your pipeline starts with some data, applies a function, then applies a function to the result, and then applies a function to the result, we have three processes, three steps, right? And as you saw, we keep applying things to the other one, right? We need a way to share these resources, these outputs and inputs between the processes. That's what we call channels, so next flow channels. They are variables, but they're not just regular variables. The same way processes are special functions, channels are special variables. They are a data structure called a queue. So a first in, first out, a queue of people, you, you can think of it like this. And you always use Nextflow channels to communicate your Nextflow processes. And whenever you have a set of processes communicating with Nextflow channels, you have a workflow. So here we have one example of a Nextflow pipeline. It's a very simple one. It's a single step. So we are going to have a process that we call here FastQC, right? It's going to have an input that we call input. It's a placeholder variable. Whatever is getting inside this process that we don't know because it's we are writing it ahead of time, I'm going to call it input, right? And you use an input qualifier to tell Nextflow what is this input. Here we are saying it's a path. It is a path to a folder. It's a path to a file. It doesn't matter. It's a path. And we say that this process is going to have an output, which is also a path. And the file name is going to be something underlined fastqc. And it will end with either .zip or .html. Then we get to one of the most important blocks, which is the script block, which tells what the step is going to do. Here, we are running a program called fastqc. It has an option minus q, and we're going to give the input. But what's the input file name? I don't know. It's whatever is getting inside this process. And that's why we use this variable here, input. And you refer to a variable with the dollar sign and the name of it. But you know, these processes, they are just like recipes for food. You can have a book of recipe, but if you don't cook them, nothing happens. So we need the workflow block here in the bottom to tell what's going to happen, what processes are being called, when, and so on. So we use a special function called a channel factory to fabricate uh, channels, right? And this special one, it creates channels with paths. It's a channel from path. And I say every file ending with fastq.gz in my current folder. And after I create this channel, I'm going to forward it with the pipe. So people familiar with the command line will recognize the pipe here. I'm going to forward with the pipe this channel to the fastqc process, which is here. So if my workflow channel was blank, Nothing, even though the process is here, nothing will be called. So you have to explicitly say, I want to use the fastqc process with this input. And then we have it here. There are many different ways to provide the channel to the, to the process. We're going to see this in time. But for now, just this example so that you have a, a grasp of what a Nextflow pipeline looks like. One very nice thing about Nextflow is that there are many, many features that make your life easier. One of them is implicit parallelism. So the thing is, if you if you have a program which does something to a sample and you have three samples and you have a very powerful machine, it's not very smart to run this program in one sample, wait it to end, then run on the second sample, wait it until it ends, and run it to the third sample, wait until it ends, until it ends. If you have a very powerful machine, 
you can run them in parallel. At the same time, use all this amazing, powerful computer I have. At the same time, I want to apply this program to these three samples. And there is a way to write this with programming languages, but you know, you shouldn't be really worrying about that because you are a data scientist, you're a, you a scientist, you're a researcher. You you, you, your expertise is with the analysis you're doing with the science, right? You shouldn't have to be fighting with the computer and installing programs and all these things. Nextflow should do that for you, and it does. So when you write your Nextflow pipeline with the Nextflow DSL, Nextflow will automatically identify the situations where it can parallelize your analysis. And this makes your pipelines run much faster. I have in multiple occasions met people that said they had their pipelines written in a different programming language for a different uh, workflow orchestrator, they converted it to Nextflow without changing anything, not even optimizing their code to Nextflow, just by converting, and it was much faster than before. And where is this magic? The magic is that Nextflow is helping you in a lot of different ways. And the implicit parallelism here, you don't have to make it explicit, it's, in, it's implicit. It's one of the reasons it's so faster. So you see here the files you have, they are in a channel, the queue. After the process, the, the all tasks, they go to a queue again, and then in the end you have your files. Of course, that in real life, you have a much more complex scenario. You have maybe thousands of tasks running at the same time. And here, just to make it clear that the, the, the concepts, you have files, you have channels, you have a process, which is the description of a task. But every time you instantiate a process, you have a task. So I can have one process. If I have 10 samples going through it, I will have 10 different tasks. So we have this parallelization. It's being represented here by multiple arrowheads. The same process, the same two processes, you have multiple tasks at the same time occurring, but Nextflow has other interesting features. One of them is what we call the reentrancy or resuming. So you see here the arrow has, they have a different color. And what I'm trying to show here is that maybe you are running your pipeline. It's a pipeline that takes a month to run in a separate computer. It's a very complex pipeline. And by the end of it, there was an outage or some issue with the operating system or some error that you wrote in your pipeline. Something bad happened and the pipeline was interrupted. So you went there, you checked the source code or the supercomputer or something like this, and you fixed the issue. Then in theory, if you run your pipeline again, it's going to start from scratch, which means another month waiting. So Nextflow has a reentrancy feature that you, you can activate by using dash resume in the pipeline command line. And by doing that, it will start exactly from where it stopped, which is this situation here, right? And not only that, you can give a name to your workflow and create some workflows and modules and so on in the sense that it's it, most of the time, you don't even have to write your pipeline. You just have to use tools to say, I want this piece from this pipeline. I want this piece from this other pipeline. I want this module here. I want this sub workflow here and so on. So you have this very high quality components that are already written by the community that you can easily plug to your pipeline. On the third day of this uh, training, you will see with Chris Hockart, about NF Core modules, NF Core sub workflows, and NF Core tools to help you handle these things. It's it will be an amazing session. I'm sure you will love it. So Nextflow is a software. Nextflow is a language to describe your pipeline. But still, we need more things, right? One of the things we need is software and also a compute environment to run. So what I mean by software here is that every step of our pipeline, we will be using computer softwares to do something to our data. So we need the software not only the description, but the software to be installed, and we need a place to run this pipeline. The computer environment could be my laptop, my local computer. It could be a computer in the cloud. It could be a cluster, a supercomputer. It could be many different things, right? And Nextflow has many built-in technology to help you with all these things. For language, for example, it supports many of the most famous Git, uh, Git providers like GitHub and Bitbucket and GitLab, Gitia. Also the AWS code commit and Azure repos, which are the cloud equivalents for Amazon and Microsoft and many other things. What this means is that you can write your pipeline, you can host it on GitHub. And just by sharing the GitHub URL with someone, they can just write next row run your GitHub URL and next row you clone or pull the repository is going to organize in your computer is going to do everything that's required. It's going to move to the right places, organize the files and run this pipeline for you. So there's a very nice integration with all these technologies here. When it comes for software, Nextflow supports natively most of the container technologies that we have today. 
Docker, Singularity, Podman, Charlie Cloud, Shifter, and many others. And not only that, it also supports some very famous package managers like Conda and Spec, which means that you don't have even to know what Docker is or what Conda is or what the parameters are, what are the options, how to install or anything like this. You just say next row, I want to use Docker and next row is going to do all the work for you. Or next row, I want to use Conda and it's going to do all the work for you. This means that you don't even have to install in your machine or wherever is the place. You don't even have to manually install the software is required for the steps of your pipeline. You just use a Docker container or a Conda environment and everything is handled for you uh, by Nextflow for you. For compute environment, is the same thing. It supports the main cloud providers like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud Platform, and also Kubernetes, OpenStack. Uh, if you're running in a cluster or supercomputer, it supports the main job schedulers like LSF, MPBS, Torquase, Learn, all these big guys. Which means that it's very easy to run your to write your pipeline once, and it will automatically work in multiple different compute environments. So here we have one example. Uh, let me move myself to the top here so it doesn't cover the, the, the script. We have a simple next row pipeline like the one we saw before. The difference here is that we have a line now at the top saying conda in a string here. So what this says is that you know if I tell next row to use conda. For this step, I want to install the fast QC software from the BioConda channel in Conda, and the version is the 0 0.12.1. This is the version of the software found in this channel that I want to install. And then you will have a configuration file, like a myloco.com, for example, where you're just going to say Conda enable true. So every time you run this pipeline, automatically it will activate Conda and install this package for you, not in your machine for you for it to be accessible for you, but just for this task specifically. And then when you run with Nextflow run main.nf, which is the name of this file, you provide the minus C in the location of your configuration file to be loaded. But you know, maybe you don't want to use Conda, you want to use containers. So you just say container and for this step, and you say a namespace in a container image name here by containers fastqc. This is a ready container image for FastQC that the BioContainers project provide to everyone for free. And then in the configuration file, I'm going to say Docker enable true. You can also have some parameters that you can provide to your pipeline. So here, for example, I'm using dash dash input and then passing some input file. In my source code for my script, I would just say params.input. And this params.input will always be replaced by whatever I have in the dash dash input. But what if I want a default value? I don't want to always type this this variable, this option. Well, you can come to the to your configuration file and add this params input in the default value, so that whenever you provide a dash dash input, this is going to be overwritten. But if you don't provide anything, this is going to be used here. Here we are using Slurm, which is a job scheduler. It's a software that people install in supercomputers and clusters in general to manage the resources that are available for multiple different users at the same time. And if you know Slurm, you know that it's you have to write a script file with a lot of information for every job you want to run. And by saying by setting the executor to Slurm here, what happens is that Nextflow is going to write this file for you for every task. This is extremely useful. It's very time saving. It's a great feature of Nextflow. And here I'm using this executor with singularity for containers. And the same instruction here for containers. Of course, these configuration files, they can get extremely complex. So here we are using, let me put me down here. Okay. Here we are using uh, Slurm. We are using singularity. We have many default parameters. We have very complex, uh, let's say, uh, expressions here. You know, I want to use a specific queue in my supercomputer. If the amount of time that I requested for the task is below three hours, use the short queue. I want the value of this variable to be short. Otherwise, say long. And you can do many different things. There's a section in the training where we were going to do some dynamic uh, requests of resources, and you, you will see how powerful this configuration is. So as you can see, Nextflow is reproducible between runs with all this package management automated, the, the use of containers, the support of so many different compute environments, make it reproducible between runs, portable between systems. You write it in your laptop, for example, and it runs supposedly everywhere, depending on how you configured it. 
And it's pretty scalable. It works for 10 samples, 1,000 samples, a million samples. It's very, very scalable. And the implicit parallelism is a key feature here. So that's next flow. You have your code, your custom scripts. You have software being managed. You have the environment being managed. But sometimes you need more than just the workflow. Sometimes you want to manage compute infrastructure. You want to manage configuration. You want to share your pipeline and the work you are doing with other people. So in the end, sometimes in some environments, you need more features. And thinking of that, we create a Nextflow Tower, which is a technology that helps you with these extra uh, tasks that are required when you have a, a large team or a very complex pipeline or you, you, you're bound by some regulations. So Nextflow Tower is very, very useful for that. And because it allows organizations and large teams to work together, you have reproducibility not only for you, be doing what you did, but for everyone. People can reproduce what you did, and you can reproduce what other people did. So Tower is a very nice technology. It's a web system. You can access it with the address tower.nf. And once you log in with GitHub or something like this, you're going to have like a launch pad with some pipelines. In the session today, we're going to have a look at, at the tower. At the tower. But what you have to know now is that there are three different versions of Nextflow Tower. You have the community version, which is open source. It's a bit outdated, but it's available. You have Tower Cloud that you can access with the tower.nf address. There are free and paid tiers. Uh, the free tier is enough for most people. And the first paid tier, which is the professional one, there's a voucher for academics. So if you're an academic, you can apply for a waiver so you don't have to pay for the professional tier. And then we have the enterprise tier, the, the enterprise version, which is commercial on prem and paid. So here's one example uh, of the management of your computing environment. You could have multiple uh, clusters here and cloud computing resources. And when you add your pipeline, you just say this pipeline is going to be running this machine and everything is managed by Tower. So people in your organization, they can access the, the computing environment that you want them to access and so on. You can manage data sets, secrets, complete environments, pipelines, teams, organization. This Nextflow Tower is an amazing tool if you think about this level of management. Here's one example of the launchpad. You have a few pipelines here. This is my private launchpad. Uh, we're going to see a real one uh, today. And it, not, it doesn't stop with pipelines, right? So Tower aims to, to provide many other uh, different features, like how, helping you develop uh, pipelines and explore, uh, data explorer for working with your data and making it easier to integrate data with the pipeline in Tower. All these tools about data pipelines, a data studio to do a post analysis, uh, a post processing analysis, right? Data analytics. So every day we have new amazing features in Nextflow Tower, uh, which is built by Sekera, which is also the company behind Nextflow. So uh, I would like to highlight that not only this training, but also the previous one that we had, like last March and last year and so on, they can all be viewed in the YouTube channel, the next the NF Core YouTube channel. So you just go there, youtube.com slash NF core, and you see all these, these training sessions recorded, uh, including sessions in other languages. So we have trainings in Portuguese and Spanish, in French, in uh, Hindi, in Portuguese, I think I said them all. So you can have the content there. And not only that, but apart from this foundational training, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to have this hands-on training, which is for people that already know some Nextflow, including people who are finishing this foundational training. And then later in this month, we're going to have the advanced training, which has very nice, interesting features to write Nextflow pipelines, but they're a bit advanced for, for most people. But everyone is welcome to join, of course. And not only that, but we're going to have the Nextflow Summit in two places this year. Last year, we had in Barcelona alone. This year, we're going to have in Barcelona and Boston. And in both places, we're going to have hackathons. So I hope to see you guys there, both in person or online, maybe. So feel free to join. There is no restriction in terms of, of level of Nextflow knowledge. Everyone is welcome to join, and there's something for everyone to do. So with this, we start we end the first part of this training session with the slides. So coming back to the website of NF Core, if we go to the events, 
you see at the bottom some instructions on how to get answers for answers for your questions, right? So if you go to the button here, it says there's a channel called September 23rd, 20 foundational in the NF course Slack. By clicking this link here, you can go to the Slack workspace and there you will find this channel. So not only during the, the, the streaming of this training, but also afterwards, you're very welcome to go there and ask your questions. And we will be more than happy to, to answer your questions related to the next flow and of course, and related topics. So let's go now to the training material. You will find it with the address training.nextflow.io. You will be able to access in different languages here. It's partially translated in some languages, fully translated in others, but we will do the training in English today. So let's click and start the Nextflow training workshop and let's do it. Second. Okay. <clears throat> So by the end of this training material, we expect you to be proficient in writing Nextflow workflows. Of course, we don't expect you to be uh, a master of it, like writing from scratch without thinking twice, very complex uh, Nextflow pipelines. That, that's not the thing, but you will be able to start writing your own Nextflow pipelines for some reasonably simple or complex questions. Depend, depends on, on how much knowledge you had before about bioinformatic tools and Nextflow and command line and Linux and so on. You will definitely know the basic Nextflow concepts. We saw we will see channels and processes and operators and factories and so on. Uh, understanding about containerized workflows, which are a key concept to, to scientific reproducibility. We will understand the difference between executing Nextflow on the cloud, the clusters, and so on. And you will be introduced to the Nextflow community and ecosystem, mostly on the third day with, uh, with Christopher Hackard on the NF Core talk, NF Core session. You will see previous recordings here, but that's not what we're gonna, we want to do today. We want to start running our training material. So here we are. Uh, you can definitely install everything in your machine, Docker and Java and Nextflow and Git and Bash and so on. But depending on, on your operating system and many other things, things can go wrong. So what we prepare for you is a, a Gitpod workspace, which is a virtual machine available on the internet that you can access using your browser. And when you enter this workspace, you will have a code editor, a terminal, and everything will be installed for you so you don't have to worry about it. So that's what, what we're going to do today here. But just to make sure it's clear to you, in order to use Nextflow, you just need Nextflow and Java, which is usually installed in any operating system. But in order to follow this training material with, with all the examples and everything, there are other things you have to install. Just to make it clear, it's all here in case you want to do it. Installing Nextflow is a, is a single command. It's very easy. And as I said, this is the website for the training material. And here is the URL of the GitHub repository for this training with all the content, all the code and everything. Okay, so we're going to come back to the beginning of this section, this environment setup, and we are going to click on Gitpod. So open on Gitpod. By clicking here, it's going to take us to, oh, Neko is trying to get the text. Uh, it's going to take us to Gitpod. I'm already authenticated, so I see this window. You probably will have to sign up using your GitHub account, for example, answer some questions, and in the end, you will have access to a GitCloud workspace. We're going to link below in this video uh, a bite-sized talk where I'm teaching you what's the goal behind GitPod, how you can set up your GitPod workspace, how you can run GitPod, and so on. So I won't get into much detail here. But the important thing to, to say is that you're going to have a, a, a browser version of VS Code, which is a code editor. You will have access to a terminal uh, and you can choose between a standard machine and a large machine. If you provide your LinkedIn account to synchronize with Gitpod, you are given 50 hours for the standard machine if you, for free, right? If you choose the large one, 
the credits are going to burn quicker, which means you will have less than 50 hours to use. Same thing if you don't provide a way to synchronize your LinkedIn with Gitpod, I think you are given 10 hours. And then these 10 hours, they burn faster if you use the large, large, large machine. Most of the time, I just use the standard one and it's pretty enough for what I do. That's what I'm going to do here today with you. So we click in continue. This is a new workspace. So it's going to take a while to be ready because it has to pull a container image, do some configurations, install some software, so it has to do, do a few things. But once it's done, I can come back later and open the same workspace and it will be much faster because the workspace is ready, right? The interesting thing is that if you are, I think, 30 minutes idle, it will interrupt your workspace, your session. But as soon as you're back, it will show you the way it was before you left. So if you were, you, if you had an open file, if you change a few files, when you're back, they will be changed the way you left them. So it's a very nice environment to work a bit and go out for lunch or go to sleep. And the next day you come back and it will be there ready for you the way you left it. So for people who are already experienced with container technologies, what's happening here is that it's building an image. So I have a Docker file. Uh, we can go in the meantime to uh, next flow, video, next flow, no train. And you will see there's a gitpod.gitpod.yaml file where we have the instructions for gitpod workspace. So we say we have this container image. I want it to be used. There's a Docker file. There's some configurations here. Uh, we use GitHub Actions to automatically build or container image and push to the container registry. So here is a Docker file for the container image. As you see, we install Nextflow and for among other things. But you don't have to worry about this. In the end, you just you're just going to type gitpod.io slash hashtag in the GitHub URL that you want to do, or just click on open on Gitpod the way I did on the training material web page. In many different places, you have this button, open and git pod. Okay, so we are finally having our workspace opened. It still takes a few seconds after it's ready because it's loading a preview of the training material that we were looking at before. It's going to open the terminal, organize the files and everything. Okay, so now it's ready. So I'm going to click here to close this debug console because I won't need it. I will just use the terminal here and the content here. So we will go again to where we were before, open a basic training. I'm going to Okay, so here are the objectives that we saw. Let's go to the environment setup. And in this section, you will have not only information about setting up a local environment for you, but some information about Gitpod. So as soon as we got here, for example, it asks us to do Nextflow info. So we have some information about the Nextflow installation in this virtual machine. And then we have the Nextflow version, which is the 23041. We have the build number. We have when it, when it was created, the operating system, where we are at, the groovy runtime and so on. Uh, there are a very nice explanation about everything in Gitpod. I will make it quicker. We have the sidebar here. We have the file explorer. We don't need this hands-on because it's for the hands-on training. We just need this NF training tree here. These are the files we will use among other things. If you want to download something to your machine with the right button, you can click and go to download. If you want to hide, the sidebar to get more space for your terminal in the preview, you can just click here in this two files icon and the data explorer will be, the file explorer, it will be, it will shrink, right? And here we have what we saw before, the training content, and here we have the terminal that we're going to use. Uh, if you know VS Code, if you have VS Code in your machine, and you, you don't have to have it installed in your machine. You don't have to have nothing installed in your machine to use Gitpod. You just need a browser, like I did, to see this website, and everything is there. The thing is, if you know VS Code, it's easier for you. So if I want to create a new file called example.nf, I just do code and example.nf, it will, it will appear here, right? And then I can do whatever you want, pin, split up. It's the same thing that we did 
that we would do with VS Code in our local machine. So I have got this explanation here that I told you a bit a few minutes ago about the, the credits burning quicker depending on, on the machine type that you choose. You can reopen a Git pod session at any time just by entering the same GitHub repository. You can also have new workspaces, but you can use again the same one and it will preserve all the modifications that you did. Uh, this training material specifically, it's built for one version, which is the 23.04.1, which is the one that we have right now. If it was different, if by the time uh, you are watching this training, maybe in the future, and the version is different, I would advise you to type this command. So you click here to paste, you go here to copy, and here you paste. And it's going to stick this version for you. Nothing's going to change here because we already, this is the version we are using, but in the future, this may be useful. Then after doing that, you would do next flow dash version, and you would see the new version that you sticked here. Nothing changed; it was the same. But just to be aware that you can use this environment variable to set the version you want next flow to run. And now we go really to the introduction of this training material. So I will shrink a bit the terminal here because it's not that useful for now, and let's focus on the contents right. Second. Mm, okay, let's go for the getting started. So the basic concepts, right? Uh, in the first part of this session today, I showed you a few concepts about Nextflow having its own DSL, the features that we get as portability, uh, the features that Nextflow provides and contribute to portability and reproducibility, scalability, all those things, the integration uh, to existing tools like within our technologies, package managers, and all these things. I also talked about Nextflow processes and Nextflow channels, right? Every step in the pipeline is, a pro is, is written in the Nextflow language as a process. And every step communicates through Nextflow channels, which are a synchronous first thing, first out data structure, the, the queues, right? Uh, you can have this example here where I have a, a channel with three elements and I have a process and I want this process to apply to each sample. So what we have actually here is the parallelization of these three tasks happening at the same time, providing three outputs in the end which are going to be queued again in the next channel, the output channel, and provided to the next step. We have this execution abstraction that I briefly mentioned, and we have some images here to show some supported platforms that allows you to write your pipeline once and change the compute environment without having to change your pipeline. You could think that in your company, you have a deal with Amazon AWS, and two years later, you get a better deal with Google Cloud Platform, the pipeline will be mostly the same. You just have to change the configuration, which is very simple, but the pipeline itself won't change. So if you found this very famous pipeline built by someone else and it was done for AWS, you don't have to worry because you just have to make some very small adjustments to make it work in the compute environment of your choice, of your choice, like a cluster or maybe Azure and so on. Mm, as I said, the Nextflow DSL is built on top of Groovy. But let's start to, to, to do some coding, right? Let's start to, to see next flow in practice. So as I saw, we can as I, as I said, you can click here to, to show the files. We're going to click on this hello.nf. Or we could just type, I'm gonna put my face to this side. I could just type code and space and hello.nf. And here we are going to describe what this script does. So in the training material, whenever you see this plus symbols, you can click and then you will see a description of the line or the part of the code that the, the plus is closer to. So we have this shebang. If you know scripting languages like Python and, and shell script or R, in many scripts we have this, which basically means that if we try to run the script without saying without saying what software we want to use to interpret it, it will pick this one. So here, if you don't say next flow, it will use next flow to run this one, right? Usually, this is not required because we want to type next row run with options and everything pointing to my next row script. But you will see sometimes this, and I think it's important to explain to you what it is. So it's telling the operating system to use this binary, this program, 
to interpret this file if it's execut executable. We are going to create a variable that we call params.greeting, and the content of this variable is going to be the string hello world. The variables starting with params. Dot, there are special variables that you can overwrite or set with the command line. You will see this in the bit. For now, just see, just keep in your keep in, keep, keep in mind that variables starting with params. Dot can be can be set and modified, overwritten based on command line arguments. And then I'm using a function here, which is called channel of, is a channel factory. I'm creating a channel which contains an element, which is this variable, params.greeting. I have a process here, the first process in my pipeline, which I call split letters. And basically what it does is just split letters. It has an input block. I'm going to call whatever gets inside this process x, and I'm saying that the qualifier is a value, so it's going to be a string. But the output of this process is a path that starts with chunk underline something. In my script block, I have some commands that already come in your operating system. So the script block is not really next row. Here I'm using print, which is a command that we have in the command line, right? We have here, hello. And I'm using split, which is also a command that you have in the command line. So you can just do man split to see the man page or split dash h dash, dash help. So you see, this is nothing I'm installing or something specific to Nextflow. It's just some command line programs that are already there. And I just want to play with them to show you a, a simple Nextflow pipeline, right? So what this line does is to print to the screen the content of the X variable, which I don't know what it is. It's just something that's entering the process, right? And I'm going to pipe this to the split program, which is which expects a string. And it's going to cut the string in pieces of six characters and store the content in files named chunk underline something. It will automatically fill this something for you. So we could do a, a, an example here. I can list what is in my current folder. And I'm going to use the print to do Marcel is teaching next flow today. Then I'm going to use the pipe to pipe this to split. I'm going to choose 10 characters. And I'm going to use the word pieces underline. So after doing that, if I list the current the files in my current directory, you will see a bunch of new ones. Pieces AA, pieces AB, pieces AC, pieces AD. Four. If I do cat to get the content of pieces AA, for example, I will find the first 10 characters of that string. Marcel is space. If I do cat pieces AB, I will get teaching space N and so on. If I get the AD, which is the last one, I will get the last 10 characters. In here, there were 10, there were three, there were the rest, right? So that's what the split command and what the print command and the split command does, right? Do, right? So it's just there. It's nothing specific to Nextflow. It's just something I'm using here to teach you Nextflow pipelines. The next process is called convert to upper. And that's what it does, it converts to upper. Again, I'm using cat and tr, which are command line programs. Uh, they come with Linux. It's nothing specific to Nextflow. I can just do here a call Marcel. And I'm going to use tr to convert every alphabetic letter from lowercase to uppercase. Then I have Marcel. I could do the opposite. I want to translate all the uppercase to lowercase. So here there's only the M, but it will be everything lowercase. So again, no next flow. That's just some programs that I chose. Cho I chose. Could be any program that you have, and it would be fine. Here's share script, but it could be Python or MATLAB, anything. But as I said earlier today, they are just descriptions of processes. Nothing is being done. You need the workflow block to say, you know, I want to apply this. I want to provide to the split letters process this channel, which is a channel that contains the greeting hello world here or something else that I provided. And then I'm going to save this to the letters underline the ch variable. So this variable contains now the output channel from this process reading this input. After that, I want to use the convert to upper process 
and provide as input the output of the previous one, but using this function, which is a channel operator. Every function that applies to a channel is a channel operator. But what does this flatten us? So let's comment the bottom of our pipeline. And let's just do a letter ch view. The view is a channel operator that consumes all the elements and show them to you, shows them to you in the screen. So next flow run hello.nf. We will see here the hello world string cut in pieces of six characters. And each piece is going to be uh, one item of our channel, right? So we have here one element in my channel, which contains two files, the AA and the AB, which is hello or something in the world. If I use the flatten, I'm going to use here the flatten channel operator, and then the view is going to flat my channel. Instead of having one channel with one element, and this element is a multi-item element, the two items, I will have two channel. Uh, sorry, I will have one channel, but with two elements, two single item elements. There are only one thing twice. And here we have one, uh, two things once. Is that one element, right? So that's what the flatten does. The collect channel operator does the opposite. So if I do a flatten and a collect and view, we're going to see what we saw first, which is one channel element containing two items. OK, that's what we see here. So when we provide to result CH this convert to upper with using flatten, I want to call this convert to upper multiple times for every piece instead of receiving a list with all these files. I want to do one at, one at a time. And then I'm going to call view to see the content in the end. So now I'm going to run this pipeline without having commented anything, everything being run. So it's hello world. I will get hello world in uppercase. We can run again, and maybe you're going to see something different. Let's see. Still hello world. OK, so you're going to see something different, and I'm going to go back, go back to what is the explanation for that. So it's what we saw. Hello, world. OK. Blah, blah, blah. One interesting thing when you run uh, an actual pipeline is that, first, you see the next row version that was used for this run specifically. You have the name of the script file that was launched with Nextflow. You get an automatic mnemonic uh, run name, which is a random adjective in the random surname of uh, the, the random, uh, a random adjective in the random last name for a famous scientist. You have the, the version of the language, which is TSL2 here. You have a revision, a revision red, a revision hash, which is like an ID of your pipeline, right? If you change the, the pipeline code, the revision changes. You have the executor, which is here is local. It could be a cluster, it could be on the cloud. Here it's local. And it tries to guess the number of tasks that will occur in your pipeline. Sometimes things are decided on the fly. So it's not so straightforward to guess the number of tasks that will be run, right? Then you have the first step here, which is split letters. It happens once. We have a string and we convert it, get a string once and convert to many files. It's done once. And we have convert to upper done twice because we use flatten to, to flat our channel that had two items, one element. Now it has two elements, right? OK, we have hello world here. You also probably notice that we have this hash here. So every step, every process, every task actually has a hash like this, which is a task directory. So we have a place in the computer where everything related to a task is stored. And we can go there. The default work directory is work. Actually, that's like this. Uh, tree, which is a program to see the, the, the file structure right in the command line. So work 44, 75, and then we do tap to autocomplete. And if we do that, we see chunk AA and chunk AB, which is the hello world split in two pieces. So this is the hash for this first task. For the second process, we have two tasks and only one hash. So this is the default way for next flow, which is one process per line. If we want to see the test directory of every task, we have to set this option NC log to false, and then we will have one test per line, and then we will have access to all the test directories. Okay, now we have this directory for each convert to upper. 
One interesting thing, I will try to run it again. Oh, okay, now it's great. Now this time you see it said world hello instead of hello world like last time. So why it's happening like that? So if you remember when I showed those pictures, those diagrams showing the implicit parallelization, you know, if you have three, three, five, three samples in your channel and you call the process three times to work with each of them, if they are very similar, you expect the first one that was ran with the program to finish first. But sometimes, let's say the third element, the third element of your channel, it was extremely light. And the first one was very heavy. So it's going to take a one hour for the first one to finish in a few seconds for the third. So because of that, the third will finish first. And then you will have something like this here, world hello instead of hello world. Sometimes it doesn't matter because you have, uh, when you start writing your real pipelines, you see that usually you have some meta information about every sample together so that regardless of the order, you know which is which. There are some process directives you can use to keep the order. There are many things you can do. But for now, just be aware that this happens. Most of the time, it doesn't matter, but it's important to know this happens. The next part is to start to learn a bit the resume and cache. I said at the beginning that tomorrow we're going to get into, into more detail about the cache, but we will already start playing with that. So this part, the goal is to change uh, the pipeline script. And in the convert to upper process, we're going to replace all this with just rev. Rev, again, nothing to do with Nextflow, it's just a program. It's used to reverse a string. Like we do like Marcel is Brazilian. And when we do the rev, it's going to say Marcel is Brazilian reversed, right? So we're going to keep the convert to upper name, but be aware that now it's not converting to upper, it's reversing the string. Okay, so we are going to run this again. But now uh, I'm going to use dash resume because I want to use the cache for the computation that doesn't require to be computed again. The first thing I want to show is that the revision ID is going to change. So here it was 197A0 and so on. It changed because we changed the script code. So when you're trying to, to see if something changed or broke, you can always check the revision code to see that if you are running the same pipeline that you ran at a specific point in time. So here, the first step, which is split letters, it was cached because it's still hello world. We didn't change that, right? So it's splitting files, it's the same thing. But the second part, we are doing the reverse now. So it's, there is no cache, it had to recompute it. If we type the same command again, now everything will be cached because we already ran with the ref, right? If we provide dash dash greeting, which is this params dot greeting, I told you that when we have the variables starting with params dot, we can override it with the command line. And instead of hello world, I say, uh, hola mundo. Now everything will have to be recomputed because the split letters has only cache for hello world. Because I'm changing it now, I will have no cache. So everything will have to be computed from scratch. And that's what happens here. And in the end, we have hola mundo backwards, which is what this half does. Uh, we play with this already. One interesting way to see that is with this figure here. So we have this variable, which is hello world. It's added to a channel. So here we have the queue, right? The channel with the element. It's provided to a process, split letters. It's expecting a value. The task, once everything is replaced, we have this format here. It is one interesting thing to show. So let's get this hash here, right? So let's do code, work, E7, 7CC. And inside that, there's a file called .command.sh. So every test directory that was run with, with success will have a .command.sh file. And this file inside has what was contains what was indeed run in the end. Because in the hello.nf, in our next row script, we have this command line, but you know, it's with variables. We don't, I mean, we, we expect to know what this X will be, but we can't be sure. So sometimes when something's going wrong, you can open your dot command of SH to see what was really ran in the end, which was Ola Mundo, right? And here, that's what it's showing. Hello world, split, and so on. The output will be two elements, right? Because there are more than six characters here. 
And then we're going to queue that in the output channel. I'm going to use the flatten to separate them into two elements. And I'm going to provide this to convert to upper. And again, we have this final batch string here is expecting a path. Indeed, it's a path for these files that contain these characters. And in the end, it's going to print to the standard output that we can view with the view operator. So with this, we end the first section, which was introduction. So again, if you have any question, you can go to the channel on Slack and we will be more than happy to help. Feel free to stop the training uh, when you think that I'm going to answer a question that I asked and you want to think about it a bit about it before or try yourself. Uh, feel free to take a break whenever you want to try to redo something I did or here again to an explanation I provided. So it's really under your control here to, to go the rhythm you want. Sometimes it's, too, it's a bit slow for some people. Sometimes it's a bit fast for some people. And we do our best to, to, do a, to provide a, a good balance for that, but it's impossible to please everyone. So feel free to increase the speed on the YouTube viewer or decrease the speed or stop as many times as you want. And again, we, are, we will be more than happy to answer your questions in the Slack channel. The next section of our training will be on configuration. So as I said, probably you can find some amazing Nextflow pipelines on the internet. You download it, and then at some point you want to run it in a different environment or you want to change a few things. So this section for configuration is specifically to, to showcase a bit the power of the Nextflow configuration and show you how you can change some settings among other things. So the, the first thing is that the first thing that Nextflow looks for when you run it is a nextflow.config file in terms of configuration, right? And if you take into consideration whatever is there. Actually, if we go to uh, the official Nextflow documentation, which is doc, uh, docs.nextflow.io, we can go to the configuration chapter here. And you see a list of different ways you can provide configuration settings to Nextflow and the priority. So the highest priority is the dash dash in the command line. The second one is using the dash params dash file option to provide a JSON file file with, with parameters. You have the minus C and so on, right? There are many different ways you can provide configuration to your Nextflow pipelines. And here's the priority, which means that whenever you have uh, a conflicting setting, it will, the priority will be resolved like this way. So let's go on. Let's continue. So the configuration syntax is basically a keyword, the equal sign, and a value. It's important to emphasize that because some settings you can use for both uh, in the pipeline script in the in the configuration file. And the difference is that when it's in the pipeline script, you won't have this equal. So we could open here, like script seven, open this file here. And you see here, for example, uh, a published year. You have a few uh, process directives, right? And you see there's only a space here. There's a keyword and the value. You could have CPUs, you could have container, you could have many different settings. But when you use the configura configuration files for that, you need the equal sign, okay? So here, just one example. I could open a nextflow.config. There's already one here with already some things inside, right? So a keyword, like we have the scope here, the key and the value. I could just add these three. And then there are variables I can access in, in, in the configuration file, right? So here, hello, and I want to replace that with property one, it will be hello world. It's important to mention that when you have single quotes, you want you won't expand variables. So it would still be dollar sign property one. When you have double quotes, it's it's resolved for it's expanded for the content of the variable, right? Same here for path, which is an environment variable. 
If you want to add comments, and it, it works both for config files and to the next plus script, single line comments, they are slash slash. But if you want to do a multi-line comment, you use slash star star slash. The scope is also interesting because you can have, like we saw here for the nextcode.config, we have process and many different values for this process scope. Same thing for Docker. So you can either just type multiple times, like alpha x one value, alpha y some value, or you could just do alpha curly braces and then all the values in closing the curly braces. So there are two different syntaxes for assigning multiple values for different keys in the same, in the same scope. We also saw the params.variables. We played a bit with it before. Here we have one example. Which is with two parameters, foo and bar. We have bonjour le monde. Here we have the workflow script. So, as an exercise, let's save this first file here as let's do myconfig.config. Let's copy, click in here. Let's go here and paste. Oops. Okay, let's save that. And this one, let's save. Oops, we can click here as params.nf, as it's being suggested by the training material. So let's save that too. And then let's run that. I'm going to run, but I'm going to add the minus C with my config file, right? Oops. My config file. So what do you think is going to happen? So we have here, hello world, but because I'm providing the configuration file, it has higher uh, precedence and it's replaced by bonjour le monde, which is here, the config file, right? If I don't provide my configuration file, then the only value is the one in the workflow script, which is hello world. And that's what we're going to see here, right? We could also, provide the configuration file, but then also say foo, hola. So it won't be hello, it won't be bonjour, it will be hola, hola le monde, right? This precedence here, but we replace the foo. We saw here that the highest precedence, the highest priority is this dash dash, right? So that's what we are showing with this exercise. One of one other scope that we have is the env1. And actually, if you go to the, the, the official documentation of Nextflow, you can go to the config scopes here, and you see there are a lot of different scopes. So if you go for Docker, for example, you have all these variables here that you can set a value. So for the environment variable, that's very interesting because you probably know that you can type env to see all the environment variables. And I can try to grab for alpha. Oops. And as you can see, there's nothing. But I could just write this foo.nf next to script, which is going to type env and filter for alpha and beta. But we know there's no environment variable called alpha or beta. We just write here and we didn't see. So let's run this next little pipeline and see what's going to happen. Nothing. Nothing is returned. But then I could get this and add to my next flow config. I'm saying that I could either do this or it's the same thing as doing that. And now in my process, when I run, it will have see these environment variables. beta in alpha. But again, if I run the same command here, I won't see anything. And that's the same thing for not having to install softwares in your machine, because it's that it doesn't matter in your machine, it matters in the task environment specifically. So here we see that in the machine, we don't have these environment variables, but in the task environment, we do have. So here's just what it show, should work. We can also look at the process scope. 
Then we have what we call process directives, which are keys that you describe how some things work, the way you want your, your process to work, the containers, right? The, the, the tasks. So here I'm saying that there are 10 CPUs, eight gigabytes of memory, uh, the container image I want to run. And because here I'm just saying process, it means that I want for all processes in my pipeline to request 10 CPUs, eight gigabytes of RAM, and to use this container image. Depending on the executor, these things will behave differently. So if you're not using containers, you're just using your machine with no containers, no or nothing, and you say CPU, stand, memory, eight gigabytes, and so on, it, it won't really matter unless the program that you want to run in the stack has a parameter to set the number of CPUs or threads and memory and time and so on. But if you're using Docker, or if you're using cloud computing or clusters and so on, then these things will be taken into consideration. And for job schedulers and clusters, you must provide these things. So it's very important to know. But again, you don't want to set the same requests in terms of resources for every step in your pipeline. And that's what process selectors are for. So you can say, let's open here because it's very nice, the official documentation on that. You can say, you know, process with the name hello, I want four CPUs, eight gigabytes of RAM, and I want the queue short to be used. Or you could say, I want 10 CPUs, like it's here, for every process, but the process called foo or something else. You can also use the label process directive, which adds a label to, to your process. And then you could say, you know, I don't care about the name of the process, but if it has a label, big mem, I want this, like big memory, right? I want this process directives. Otherwise, nothing. You can also use some expressions to evaluate, like if the label is foo or bar, I want two CPUs and four gigabytes of RAM. Or you could have more expressions like this one. Any process, but the ones with full label uh, with the label full with with the full label support CPUs. If it has the full label, two CPUs, and so on. You, you can do a lot of the stuff. There is a selector priority here. It's a long reading and lots to learn when you practice with that. But the idea is to show how powerful these process selectors are, along with the configuration in general, to make your pipeline very powerful in terms of portability into the specific compute environment that you want to focus its execution. Here you have the, the syntax for memory and time and so on. And there's one example here that you have. I want to request for this specific process. I'm not using configuration files here. I'm writing these things in the script file. I want for this process full, four CPUs, two gigabytes of RAM, one hour in timer in time, which means that if the task takes more than one hour to finish, it will be killed. You don't want it to, 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 to take more than one hour. And then maximum number of retries is three. So here we are not setting the error strategy in the example, but the idea is that if we say retry, for example, when something bad happens, you can say, I want the maximum number of retries to be three. Even though I said the error strategy is retry, if it gets to the third attempt, terminate the pipeline. I don't want to keep retrying, right? And here's one example of a program that you provide the number of CPUs and memory to the program itself even though we are running locally here and this wouldn't be taken into consideration. You can also have some lazy uh, expressions like closures here. So I want four gigabytes of RAM times the number of CPUs. So if someone says this process full, you have two CPUs, it will be eight gigabytes of RAM, right? Uh, and many other things you can do. Here is some talking a bit about the, the Docker scope. So you say Docker enabled equal true. You, we saw that at the beginning of the session today when it was showing Conda and Docker and Singularity. We had this uh, Docker enabled true, Conda enabled true, Singularity enabled true, and so on. And the process container, which says we provides the container image for all the processes being done this way, or for specific processes when we use process selectors. We won't really get into singularity, into details about singularity during the session today. So in a few sessions, you see singularity. If you like singularity or you want to get into more detail about it, you are free to go, but I won't do that. And singularity is not installed in our Gitpod environment, so you won't be able to play with it here, right? But if you are a fan of singularity, the content is here for you. Oops, I clicked the singularity hub extension. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next one, the conda execution. So 
you can, as we saw in the slides, you can provide instructions to install the FastQC package in a specific version from the Bioconda channel with Conda. Or you can already, maybe you already have a Conda environment in your machine that you built with a specific recipe. You can just provide to Nextflow the path to the, to the Conda environment. And this path will be activated for that task specifically. So with that, we finish this configuration uh, section. Mm, let me see if there's something else I wanted to mention here. There are many things you can do actually. So if we come here uh, to the configuration profile, we have the scope env that we saw and many other ones. So the conda, let me see if there's something interesting here. Mm, the executor we saw already for uh, is learn, right? So we have many different ones. It could be SGE, it could be the local is the default one, which is the local machine, right? It could be Slurm. There are many, many uh, different ones. You have Kubernetes, you have email. You can send an email at the end of the pipeline execution to say everything was fine. Uh, you can use the manifest scope to put information about the author of the, pipe, of the pipeline. Um, you can specify the minimal required version of Nextflow to run your pipeline. That's very interesting. You can have this notification scope. As you can see, the list is very long. There are many, many things you can do. The process scope is probably the most important one. So if you want to pick one to really read and understand, I would suggest you to choose the process scope. It's what we call the process directives, and they are very, very powerful and useful if you want to uh, modify an actual pipeline or write your own. So I have the... Re uh, to get into more details about the process, the, the, the process directives, you can come here to the process section and go to directives. And as you can see, it's very, very long. Here we're going to have the executor one, and you see we have support to AWS Batch, Azure Batch, Condor, Google Life Sciences, Ignite. Uh, I mean, the number is, is very, very large, and we have more actually right now. We even, we even have to update this. Uh, this fair one is very interesting. So at the beginning, we saw when sometimes we have hello world or world hello. And one way to ask Nextflow to force the ordering is to use this fair directive. The fair word comes from fair threading. So it won't try to make it the more efficient way, but it will guarantee you that even though they are in parallel, the resources will be provided to every task in a democratic way so that the first one will in the end end first. So with that, you have the, the certainty that if you provided a channel with A, B, C, D, the output channel will in the same order have the transformed version of A, of B, and C, and D. This is the label one that we saw. You can add a label big memory, for example, for a process. This is very useful because sometimes you have 30 processes and you don't want to use a process selector with the 30 names. So you just say, you know, I'm going to add the label big memory to all these guys. And then I just say, I just use the process selector with label. You have machine type for, for Google Life Sciences, max errors, you know, they're, it's very, very long. But, you know, this is what makes it very powerful in terms of portability. It's very, very nice to, to pay attention for that, to that. With that, we are over the configuration settings. Again, if you have any question, feel free to ask in the in this Slack channel. The next part of our training session will be on the deployment scenarios uh, section here. So most of the time, you probably write your pipeline on your laptop, you're going to do some tests there and it's completely fine. But at some point when you really want to run your pipeline with real data, you will need uh, maybe some cloud infrastructure, some HPC, or maybe even a, a small server in your laboratory or company or something like this. At this point, you have to do some configuration to make sure next row you run accordingly. So here, one example is that you can just use the default local executor. So some configuration, your next flow script, the next flow program is going to use the local executor to use the local operating system. Or maybe it will use it will you use a grid executor using Slurm or PBS, Turkey, and so on, which is going to communicate with the batch scheduler, which is these guys that I'm talking about, Slurm, for example, 
maybe some network file, valve system, some shared drive or something with a, in a cluster, right? So here we already saw most of the things that we are going to see in the section. We saw already in the previous one in the configuration. So in the process scope, we have the executor process directive and we provide where as the value, for example. So let's, uh, look, we were looking at the hello.nf with the ref. Let's run it again. Uh, hello.nf, we can use the dash resume. So I don't have to break compute things that have been have already been run. Okay, in the end, it was a different phrase. No, no cache was here. Cool. So let's see that. Let's say that I, I'm going to open the next config. And I'm going to say that I don't want to use this guy. I'm going to erase, erase everything. And I'm just, okay, I'm going to erase everything. I'm not going to put anything. But no, actually, I'm going to put the, the just like it's here, I'm going to put the process executor to be slur. The issue here is that I don't have slurm installed. So one of the program of the programs that slurm uses is sbatch. Sbatch is not installed. So this won't work. But I'm, there's a reason I want to do that, even though it won't work. So let's just run the white line. It won't work because as patch is a command not found. Okay. I'm going to get the hash of the task, which is AC 3D. So code work AC 3D. And I'm going to open it dot command dot sh, which we know is just the print hello world with the split and so on. But I'm going to look now at a different file, which is dot command dot run. And you see at the beginning, a few instructions here, which is the some some it's a script that Aspatch and Slurp expect in order to know how to prepare the, the, the job submission, the resources that are required. It's very simple here because we didn't say much, but we, we could have said CPU stand, memory one gigabyte, time one hour. We could do something like this. So when we run it again. It's going to fail again because we still don't have a batch. That's not the, the purpose here. Just want to show you what Nextlo does for you on the background. So BD18, right? The, the hash here. So code work, command at run. And now you see here the 10 CPUs, the one hour time, the 1024 megabyte, which is one gigabyte memory. So all this weird syntax here with minus C, minus T, dash, dash, man, which is different from what we did before. It's specific to learn. And next we'll prepare this file for you. If we open the nextflow.config and instead of slurm, we say SGE, for example, which is another uh, batch scheduler, job scheduler, and then run it again. This is going to fail because we don't have the software installed. Here's QSub. We don't have QSub installed. So the same reason it didn't work. But let's look at the task directory. So work.command.run. You, know, you see, it's the same thing. We're still providing information to the job scheduler, but the syntax is completely different. We don't have the dash dash mem anymore. We have mem free, age underline RSSS. We have minus L here. The syntax is completely different. And you would have to do for every task a file like this if you didn't have something like Nextflow. So even though we can't show it working here, you see that Nextflow does a lot of work on, 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 on the background for you. Right. Uh, I'm gonna refresh this because I accidentally closed the training preview. I'm gonna open a new workspace because I remember the command that opens the, the training page. I think it's GP preview, but I don't want to lose time looking for it. So we just open a new one.
So let's just open it here in the meantime so we can have a look at the other stuff. So deployment scenarios, we're looking at Slurm and everything else. Uh, as I said, there are some process directives that you can use. So the amount of time you want uh, the process to know. So the amount of time at the maximum that you want your task to use, the amount of disk storage, memory, CPUs, hue, and so on. Uh, you can do that either in the workflow script, as we saw, or here in the in the configuration file. There's many blog posts, like I, I, there are some referred here on how to use Nexo on HPC, but one of the most common uh, tips is that you should, instead of getting to the login or head node, when you get inside your cluster, instead of just typing Nexo run, you should ideally write uh, like here is this Lerm, for example, as Lerm script to launch Nextflow as a job and as being a job, run other jobs. Because in some uh, clusters, there are some very strict limitations uh, for the head login node. So, you know, it, it depends. It, it, it's, it's, it's something like in a, in a cluster basis, you have to talk to the administration of your cluster to understand what are the limitations, the number of jobs a job can submit and so on. But usually it's advised that you run Nextflow as a job and not just like from the command line. Uh, we also saw here the process selectors. Here we have another example. So I want to run on Slurm the queue short, taking a bunch of RAM for CPUs and so on. But if the process is named foo, then I want something different. And if it's named bar, I want something different too. So here we have one exercise to alter, uh, to change the script7.nf that we haven't seen yet. But it's basically to go to this file and change it. Okay, let me see from inside here, it's easier. So basically, Go to this file, but specify for in the configuration file in nextflow.config that for the quantification process, you want two CPUs and five gigabytes of memory. So if you want, you can pause the video now and try to do that. And to make sure it worked, you can have a look at the test.cpus variable or the .command.run or .sh files inside the test directory to check if it was used. I'm going to show the solution now. So pause if you don't want to see it. And basically, that's what you have to do. It's very simple. You can also use labels as we saw before. Uh, you can have a container per, per process, a container image per process, which is the preferred way. It's the, the, the best practice. In a second, uh, we're going to see more about managing dependencies and containers, and you will understand the, the power of that. One very interesting thing when it comes to configuration and deployment scenarios is the profiles. So in the configuration file, you can have this scope called profiles. There's always one called standard, which is the default. And then you have the other ones that you can create. You can give any name and give any configuration inside. Here is just an example with cluster and then choosing the executor to be SGE and the queue to be long and so on and so on. And now we also created one called cloud that's using a WS batch with this container image and so on. So what this means is that you can create your pipeline with some profiles so that if someone wants to test in the local machine, they just use no profile, which is standard. But if they want to test in the cluster, they say dash profile cluster or dash profile cloud. And you can also use multiple profiles at the same time. So for the NF core pipelines, which are some curated pipelines that we have, you can run with the profiles test, comma, Docker, which means it's going to make like a, a, a simpler run for test purposes with using Docker because you don't have the software installed in your machine. So it's going to pull the container images and run the containers with all the dependencies that your pipeline requires. And inside the container, the pipeline is going to be run the tasks will be run, right? So here we will have one example setting the profile cluster, but in here we see standard and cloud. So you can have multiple profiles at the same time. For cloud, here we have one example. Uh, make it, So you write this in your machine, for example, but then you want to deploy it to the cloud, to AWS batch. So you set the process executor to be AWS batch. You choose a queue that you configured, a container image to be used, 
a work directory in here is an S3 bucket, the AWS region, and a path for the AWS CLI, right? And by doing this, you, you can call this uh, profile Amazon and you can run it like that. You can also mount some, some volumes like with Elastic Block Storage, it's a Amazon service. You can just do AWS, the scope AWS and the scope batch volumes and you just provide the path here. You can have multiple uh, volumes for AWS batch. You can have custom job definitions. I don't want to spend much time here in these details. It's very specific to AWS, but the idea is to show to you that there's a lot you can do. You can have a launch template. You can have here. You can have hybrid deployments. So when I use every uh, run everything on Slurm, except when the process has a label called big task. In this case, I want to use AWS Batch. So you have this hybrid deployment where some tasks will be run in your local computer or in the cluster, and some specific processes will be run in the in the in the on the cloud, right? Uh, if we go to the next flow, oops, to the next flow website or the Secura website, both have a blog. So you can go to company blog. And here at the top, we have the blog. In both cases, you have lots of stuff on AWS, for example. So here clicking AWS, you have some tutorials using AWS with Tower and so on, announcing. Uh, some interesting features. It's a lot of stuff you can do with uh, with uh, AWS and AWS Batch and Nextflow. In here, we have a very nice blog post on Google Cloud. It's one I wrote. So get started with Nextflow on Google Cloud Batch. So these are blog posts that get into more detail on how to run your Nextflow pipelines uh, on the cloud in the language that's more informal. Because of course, you can always go to the official documentation and all the information is there. But sometimes it's it's too technical. And these blog posts, they're very nice for beginners that want to, to run. So this want to, to run Nextflow pipelines as soon as possible to see the, the effect of making it of having it working, right? So this one has a, like a step-by-step -step guide on how to use uh Nextflow pipeline, the RNA seq one to run on Google Cloud. So it's short, not very long, has some print screens. I, I like it a lot. So if you want to play with Google Cloud, that's a nice way to start. Mm. Yeah, that's it for the deployment scenarios. The next section we were going to talk about Nextflow Tower. This next session will be on Nextflow Tower. So as I introduced you briefly before, Tower is the is a software, is the Nextflow Tower. It allows you to do many, many interesting things. I'm going to sign in here with my GitHub. I have a, another account, but I'm going to use the, the GitHub one, which is one I used to play. Uh, as soon as you get here, you see you have this uh, organization, which is community here, and you have this workspace called Showcase. Everyone who creates an account on, on, on Tower will get the same thing here. You, you can access that. And you have a hundred free CPU hours to run all these pipelines and play with them. So this is the launch pad. You have the list of pipelines that you have added by your organization. Here, Secure added a few for us to play. So there are some tags here. Uh, let's play with NF Core and seek, for example. It can it, it has it's, it's already assigned an AWS compute environment for it to run. It has the GitHub. URL for the and of course RNA seq data pipeline. You can do a few things here. You can view, you can optimize. Let's view it and see what happens. There's a label. The compute environment is this one. There's some resource labels, some config profile by default assigned, which is tests. Uh, no pipeline secrets. So pipeline secrets, uh, which are here, you can manage them. Is like some passwords or tokens that you don't want to have written anywhere. So Tara will on the fly replace some variable placeholders with the secret for you. So it's a, it's a very interesting feature. Uh, you can manage secrets, as I said. There are a few secrets here, right? Uh, you can see the participants in this uh, workspace, in this organization. You can have some credentials, and we indeed, ha we indeed have some credentials here. Uh, compute environments, there are two. Data sets, we have a few data sets here. Actions, which are some triggers that can happen. We are not going to play with them today. And runs. So here we don't, not only we see my runs, 
which is the execution of an Nextflow pipeline, but we see the runs of everyone in the community. So I know Adam, for example, but I don't know this person. So some have succeeded, some have failed. So I will just go back to my launchpad. I'm going to choose one, which is the RNA seq one, and I'm going to click on launch. So uh, uh, a form will appear with a few things already filled for me, like an adjective in the last name of a scientist, as I said before. There is some input files by default, a default out the output directory. I would just go down there and I'm going to believe everything and just click on launch. So by clicking on launch, it's going to launch my next little pipeline is here. For now, it's submitted the status. I'm going to click on it so I can see more things about it. That's the command line that was used. So run the GitHub URL, I give a name, I give a params file with the input and so on. I said I want to run with tower. This is the revision of the GitHub URL. You can have the master and other branches. And I chose the profile test. So far, nothing happened. It's still submitting, I would say. So this takes a while because it's creating a virtual machine on, on, on Amazon and so on. It's going in the US batch. It's managing the resources, checking for available infrastructure. We have here the wall time. A few seconds have gone already. And for now, everything is empty. If we go to runs, uh, let's look at this one, for example, which is, okay, this one, which is an RNA 16 pipeline, but Adam ran it much earlier today. Not much earlier. Like a, Okay, a bit earlier. So let's click on it. It's over, so we have more information. So there were almost 200 tasks that were uh, executed and they all succeeded. We can see here information about every task. So here, for example, I can click on it and I have uh, the name of the task, the command that was actually ran and it's here. Uh, the status was, the exit status was zero, which is good. It's a complete success. There was one attempt. This is the work directory specifically for that task. We have some environment variables here. We have the time when it was submitted, when it started, uh, when it completed, the duration, real time. We have what container image was used. We have the queue, the number of CPUs requested, memory, time, disk. I mean, we have lots of different things. As you can see here, there is nothing specific to the, to the pipeline. I don't know the data. I don't know the result. So when you use Tower, it doesn't have access to your data specifically. Everything is done on your compute environment, which is AWS here. So Tower doesn't have access to that. Here we have some information about how long it took. It took 16 minutes. There's a amount of CPU time, blah, blah, blah. There's an estimated cost in, in, in uh, because it's a cloud, so we can estimate that. Some statistics here. And one thing that's very interesting is this, this chart here. So we have in this tab here, the amount of resources that were used as, as percent of what was allocated. So you said you would need this amount of resources, but actually use very little compared to, to what you requested. So based on that, we can fine tune the amount of resources we are requesting, which means cheaper machines and, and faster computation and then less money being spent. So same thing here for memory, job duration, I.O. and so on. So sometimes when you look at the launch pads, you're going to see this icons, which means you know you can optimize this pipeline. This is optimized already, which means that Tower can help you spend less money. So our pipeline is running now. So let's see how many tasks have succeeded so far. Okay, so we have four submitted tasks. No task succeed or fail or anything. It's still at the beginning. We don't have much. So we have these four on orange here being executed. So we can see the command, but it hasn't started yet. OK, so let's do something slightly different. Let's follow the tutorial here and the training material. So if you don't you want to use the tower launchpad and everything, you don't have to. You can use the command line here. So let's do the uh, hello.nf. It's going to reverse hello world for us. World, hello. Let's do greeting. Hello, my beautiful world. world. Cool. 
But you know, I don't, I don't have many much information here. I want to run this with Tower so that I can get more information about the pipeline and to have the run register and the base so I can look and show my friends and other people can watch with me what's happening. Even though it's running in my machine, I want it to be monitored in a way that other people can monitor what's going on. So I'm going to use dash with dash tower. However, it won't work because it doesn't know what's my tower account or anything. So it's missing the next world tower access token. So I'm going to go back to tower. I'm logging in with my account. I'm going to come here, your tokens. And I'm going to create a new one. So I'm going to say NF core training. That's the name. It's going to give to me this token here. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go back to here and I'm going to export tower access token equal that hash. And by doing that now, when I run dash with dash tower, it will identify by this token who am I and it's going to submit to my run page on tower. So it even tells you the, 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 the URL if you want to go straight to it. But instead, I'm just going to come to my I'm going to go here to the run page and it will be there. Runs. Okay, so it's a different organization. It's my Amy Hibero Dantas. Runs. And it's here. Hello. With an F. So if we click here, it was very quick because it's not running on the cloud. So there's no virtual machine being created, resources being analyzed, nothing like that. It's just the same speed. So it was very, very fast as you saw here in the end, right? So here we see six tasks, five convert to upper and one split letters. And indeed, when we go to next world tower, we see six here, which are cached. So let's do something different. I'm going to do it again, but I'm going to provide a different string. I'm going to say, I hope you guys are having a lot of fun. So everything is new, so nothing will be cached. So let's open the URL that's going to be provided here. Let's go there. Oops. Let me copy this. Now we have eight tasks, which are indeed correct. We had seven convert to upper here and one split letters. They all succeeded. There was no cache. This is the line that we ran. Uh, we can click and get details about this task, but there was not much to do. We didn't, but the container by default was this one. Why? Because by default, when you open the decoder config in this training material, we have the process container here in the configuration file. So it's used for everyone. Uh, the CPU's one is by default. The executor is local. And then some statistics about how much resources the task used. So next load tower is very, very useful to, to help you monitor your, your pipelines. And then you can share with your friends that are in the same organization or same workspace, all the runs, you can follow things together. You can discuss stuff. You can have a, link, a launch pad that's, that is shared. So here in complete environments, I don't have any, but if I had something configured here, I could, I mean, you can add, of course, you can get, if you have access to Amazon AWS, you would say, I want to add this patch, you would share the credentials you got from them and you would have access to a complete environment. Basically you would come here to launch pad, add new pipeline. You would put the, the complete environment you want to use and here the GitHub URL. So you can run your pipeline, it would appear here in the launch pad. So going back to the training material here, you saw me showing you Nextflow Tower with the web interface, right? And everything, the launch pad, but you don't have to, to necessarily use it, the, 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 the graphical user interface. You can also use uh, the command line interface, right? So we don't have the Tower CLI installed in Gitpod, but I have in my machine. So I can show you what I can do. So I just exported uh, the Tower access token the same way we did on Gitpod. 
And then I'm going to do TL, T, uh, TW uh, runs list, for example. And this will provide me the list of runs, the project name, if it failed or not, the submission date and everything. In here, I could do uh, workspace. Let me see here, uh, dash help, W, could do workspaces. Let's see what option I have. Workspaces list. And it would list the workspaces for my account. And here is just a showcase, the, the community showcase, right? I didn't create another one. Uh, it, it's a very powerful command line. I think it's a bit advanced maybe to go in the foundational training to more detail, but I just wanted to show to you that Nextflow Tower adds a new layer of features for you to monitor your pipelines and to work together in a team, in a, an organization, in a lab, and be it in the command line with the TW uh, CLI or in the web interface, you have plenty of power to monitor your pipelines and do a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> So you can also use the API to interact with Tower. Maybe you have an application that want to use the API. The documentation is very rich, so you can come here and read into more detail if you are interested in. You can really set everything in Tower according to organization and permissions and workspaces and so on. So it's very, very nice if you want to, to organize access to some compute environments or to some pipelines and credentials and data sets and, and so on. So I have what account I have here. So these actions are also very interesting. You have this outlet workflow executions. You can use GitHub hooks. It's up to your creativity on, on what you want to trigger the, the launch of some pipelines. So let's go to, oops, like this. Let's go to Marcel, the Hiberodontos here. And you can add a new organization. I'm gonna create uh, Nextflow Training as the name. Let's see what else I don't have to do. Okay, so we have Nextflow training now. I can get inside it and there is no workspace. So let's add a workspace, workspace one. Okay, this is the first workspace of my amazing uh, organization. I'm gonna make it private. And now we have here a new organization with a new workspace and I can add people to participate. So we have access to the settings now, participants, lots of stuff that you can do. There are some demos on, on YouTube in, in the Nextflow uh, channel and demos that Secure does. So Nextflow is, is Nextflow Tower is also a product. So if you if you want more details, there's there are better channels for you to get information about that. It's, it, get, it gets a bit out of the scope of this train. But in the end, that's what we had prepared for showing to you in this tower section. So now let's go to the next session or next section of our train today. So this is the last part of our training session today, the first day where we will go through managing dependencies and containers. This is a very important section, and some of the concepts here may look complicated if it's the first time you're ever hearing about containers. So again, don't, 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 I mean, feel free to, to pause and read again and to practice with the examples that we're going to see. It's worth it because once you master uh, handling containers and conda environments with Nextflow, things are much easier to make sure your pipelines will be reproducible. So Docker is the most famous container technology. Uh, it's not the only one, but it's the most famous one. And you have a command line program called Docker that's already installed here and you can use. <clears throat> so a very common, a very famous and basic, right? Uh, container image is the hello world one. So you can just type Docker 
let me try to increase a bit here the font docker run hello world as if it's the as it's the first time i'm running it it says that it cannot find locally the image so it's pulling from the internet but where is it pulling from the same way we have github for source code you also have container registries for container images so the default one for docker is docker hub and it's pulling this hello world from docker hub now once it's done it will run as i requested it and you just have some hello from docker this message shows that your installation appears to be working correctly it's so just a a common container image that we use to check if Docker is working okay. We're going to use a different command now called Docker pull to pull the image of Debian using this tag, which is a label you have to refer to a specific version of a container image, for example. So here, let's do that. Docker pull Debian. So it's pulling it and it's here. So we can just uh, do Docker images now, and it's going to, to list all the container images that we have pulled in this machine, in this Gitpod workspace. It's basically the next one we have played with it before, the Hello World that we just pulled, and the DB1, DB1 that we just pulled also. One interesting thing you can do is that you can use Docker run to run a container, right, to, to get the container image, which is just like a, you can think of it as a recipe, but it's, it's ready. It's like a, a cake in your fridge. And when you want to eat it, when you want to interact with the cake, you have to open the fridge and put it on a table. So you, you can think of it as the container. So you have the container images stored in your machine. And when, when you want to run these containers, you use Docker run and the container name. But then you can use this minus TI, which is to get an interactive terminal. And you say bash to run bash inside the container and to give you access to play with it right so by doing this you will get a shell inside the container i can do ls for example and it show it will show me lots of folders here i can do who am i i'm root but if i exit the container and do who am i it's gitpod if i do ls i see the files that we already know that are here so you can really see here that we are inside uh the container so i can go inside again and I will try to find the program that is not installed in the container. You know, tree. Okay, tree is not installed. But if I leave the container, we know that tree is installed. So this is the type of isolation that you that you achieve with containers. You can have uh, a space, a, a place in your computer where it's very specific and controlled and has installed what you need that your machine in general won't have. So that's the what the containers provide to you. We pulled a few containers here, but what you usually want to do is to create your container image. So I'm going to create a folder here called uh, playing with Docker. I'm going to get inside it. And I'm going to create a file called Docker file. That's by default the, the file name that we use when we want to, to view the, a, a Docker, Docker file. So I'm going to put my name here is Marcel, my email here, Iberdanta, Sikera, Yo. And then basically it's going to run the apt-get command to update and install curl and calsade. And by adding this path, I will be able to, to find this calsade binary here. So I'm going to save and follow the instructions, which are to build this image. So now the command is docker build. I'm going to give a name, a label to my image, which is my image. You could do any name. And dot to say that the Docker file is in the current directory. So it's going to build my image. It will appear when we do the, the Docker images in the end. Docker images. It's here, as you can see, my image. was created three seconds ago. It's very small. And then I'm going to use this line this command line to run my container and run the cow save program with the parameter with the with the argument hello docker and if you know cow say you probably can guess what's going to happen with this cow say is not installed in git pod but inside the container it is and then we can use it i could also get inside like i did before like this give me an interactive terminal and a brand bash and here i can do cow say hello next slow and 
enthusiasts. And then we have this. Let's leave the container. So let's open our Docker file and do a few modifications. So I will add the following line to add more stuff to my container image. I'm going to use curl to download this, this file, which is compressed. I'm going to uncompress it and move the files to specific directories. What this does is that I can just call someone and the operating system will know where to find. So it's just a Docker file. I have to build again my new container image. Let's do it. There's some cache. As I didn't change the things before, it was cached. And only the third one, which is the new run, will be on. And then I can just run this command line, which says run the my image container. And I want to run the someone with dash dash version. When we do that, we will get the version of someone. Again, if I do this on Gitpod, it's going to give me command not found because someone is not installed, but it is installed inside my container. We can do what I just did a few times already, which is to get interactively inside the container image. And inside, we can do someone dash dash version or yeah, this. Mm. But then you can say, OK, Marcel, I have this container image. It has someone installed, but when I get into the container, I cannot see the files in Gitpod. So I want to use someone, which is a bioinformatics software, to do something to my uh, samples. But if I cannot see my samples, how can I do that? So one way to do this is to mount uh, volumes. You say, I want this part of my operating system of my disk to be accessible from within the container image. But for now, let's try to run this command, which is going to fail. But it's what if you know Salmon, that's what, what you would do. Use the Salmon index command to create a reference index based on a, a, re a reference transcriptome, which is here. And the folder where I want this index to be stored is called transcript index. But then it's going to tell me that it cannot find this file. So the file blah, 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 does not appear to exist. And indeed, it doesn't. But if I set the volume like this, so you say dash dash volume, that's what I have in my computer, and that's what I have to what I want to see inside the the, the container image. So what happens? I'm gonna change it a bit. I'm not gonna uh, run salmon. Instead, I will get inside with bash and the uh, minus ti that we saw already a few times. So by getting inside the container, just like I was doing before, but now with the volume, you will see that the transcriptome.fa, it's here. Because I said, I want this guy, which is in this path, to be inside the container in this path. So it's the root directory and transcriptome.fa. So leaving the container and running again this long line that we have here, which is to run. I can see this file, and I want to run someone with everything. Let's see what's happened. The thing is, this guy happens to be a directory. Hmm, it's not a directory. One second. OK, so I'm not in the right folder, I believe. Yes, I need the folder. So let's go back to the right directory, not the plane with Docker. Let's run from here. So it ran. And if I go into the transcript index folder, we will see the result. The comment before, though, it would have worked because we didn't mount the right way for the container to be able to write. And while it's writing, we see uh, outside the container image. So this new command fixes that by saying, you know, this whole working directory that I have, that I am right now, I want this, the same thing to be outside. And then when we save it this way inside the container, we can see that from outside the container, right? And that's what we, I just used the tree here. But you see, it, it's starting to get very complicated, right? 
So choosing the image and running, choosing the work directory and the volume and the command, it's going to be like a long line. It's a pain and you don't have to do that. So actually what I'm, what I'm showing to you is just like the, the raw way of doing that. But Nexo does, that, does everything for you. You would have to do this for every task. Maybe you have thousands of tasks. You don't have to do that because Nexo will do it for you. So there's this bonus section here to show how you can sub, how you can push the container image you just created to the Docker Hub container registry. You can follow the instructions here and do it on yourself, but by yourself. But uh, we will skip it here. It's going to take a while and so on. But okay, so we can see that we have these files here in the script too. It is a very simple pipeline with a single process, which is what we were doing right now, like. Creating a, 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 a genome, creating an, an index with Salmon, right? So what this tab is telling you, oops, is to provide your Docker image instead of the the regular one that we have, which is this uh, nextflow slash rdc dash nf, right? So how do you do that? You can just do like this. Okay, let me copy everything here. And by doing this with Docker my image, you are actually overwriting that process dot uh, container. And if you look at the work directory, yeah, this task, the dot command dot run, and you look for Docker run, you will see that the image name is my image. So we can confirm that the container image that was used for this task is my image, the one we just created. If we run this again without this my uh, with Docker, and again, the reason this is working is because our nextflow.config it has Docker enable. Uh, okay, it needs to have Docker enable. That's why, that's why we got the someone command not found. We have to put. Oops, wrong folder wrong next world config. We have to put Docker enable through here. And by doing that, now when we don't say anything about with Docker, it will use Docker and it will use that container image that we have here, which is nextflow slash rnc dash nf. So let's get this test directory dot command dot run. Let's look for Docker run and we see that this is the container image that we are using. It's not my image anymore. So as you can see, by inspecting the dot command dot run and the dot command dot sh, as we have done a few times, you can really investigate how your pipeline is working. So now that we played a bit, uh, and again, you saw that we did like all the mounting volumes and everything, but now we didn't do anything. We the only thing we did was to either with with Docker or here, but my image. That's all we did. So Nextflow was in charge of running everything, mounting the volumes. We didn't have to do anything. We just ran the pipeline as before, providing that uh, container image. And Nextflow pulled the image, found it, ran, mounted the volumes, moved the files to one place, moved it back, and did everything. So maybe it was a bit confusing in the beginning because indeed you have to mount volumes, you have to make the container see what's outside and then be able to write outside so that when you leave the container, you can read the files is a bit fuzzy. Definitely complicated if it's the first time you're hearing about containers, but we can see now that Nextflow does everything for you without you having to worry or even having to understand that. You just say Nextflow, I want this process to use this container image, take care of everything. And Nextflow will take care of everything for you. The Singularity is another container technology. It's very famous in, in, in cluster settings. Uh, in HPC and supercomputers, people very commonly use Singularity, but we are not going to get into more detail about it here. There's a whole section about it. It's not installed in the in the Gitpod, but there's content enough content here for you to, to understand. You can run Docker containers with Singularity. So most of the time, even the competitors, they support uh, Docker containers. But again, Docker is the most famous one. So I think it's, it's worth learning Docker, even if you want to use another one uh, afterwards. So we got the basics about containers. That's good. That's very important if you want to, to work with Nextflow. 
Now let's do something different. Let's work with Conda. One second. So Conda is a popular package manager, mostly in bioinformatics. You have some, you have a, a package repository with some channels with many, many different software. You have thousands of softwares in the Conda uh, package repository. And you use the Conda command line program to, to, to install this in your machine. You can create an environment in the sense that when you activate this environment, the programs work. When you deactivate them, it doesn't work anymore because the, the environment paths, the, the environment variables that are used to find uh, where the binaries are, they are changed so that you can only use a program when you have the environment activated. Maybe you want to have a few environments with the same software in different versions in each environment. So it's important to, to, to do the management of these environment variables. One thing we're going to do here is to start, use Conda init. Okay, we're gonna update uh, our, our, our terminal by just typing bash. It's gonna like a reset, open a new one, and then you have the base uh, Conda environment loaded. And what we are going to do is to write the file call env.yaml with this content. I think it's already created here, actually. Uh, env.yaml. And this has the name of a Conda environment, the channels you want Conda to look for, the package that you want. So I want someone in the BioConda channel in this version, fastqc, and so on. So by having this file, you can use this command, Conda env create in the file to create a Conda environment with the name that you have inside, with the packages that you have inside. This takes a while because Conda will check what software it has to install so that someone is going to work. So even though we asked it to install four softwares, it may have to install many more softwares and many more packages because each of these packages, they, they may have dependencies and these dependencies may have dependencies and so on. So it's it, it can take a while to calculate what it has to install. In the meantime, I will advance a bit. When this is done, we will be able to type conda env list and it will list all the environments. We have the base loaded and we see the star here showing that, but we will also have the NEF dash tutorial. And this is going to be the path for this environment, which means that we're gonna have some programs inside that are not automatically uh, found when you type a command, but when you activate this environment, the programs that are here, they will be easily accessible just by calling them by the name. We activate a Conda environment with the Conda activate command. And when you do that, this base here is going to change to any app dash tutorial, for example. So with that, one thing you can do is to run the next run command, just like before, but instead of with Docker, you're going to do with Conda. And here we are passing an environment, a Conda environment path, which means that when I'm typing this next row run, this environment doesn't have to be loaded, doesn't have to be activated in the sense that I can type salmon, for example, and I will get command not found. But by providing this with Conda, for the task folders, for the task environments, when the tasks are running, salmon will work because the environment will be activated specifically for every task. Instead of providing the environment path, I could just provide, as we saw in the deck, in the slide deck at the very beginning of today, where I said Bioconda uh, and the name of the package and the version, and it will build an environment for us and activate this environment whenever it's needed. Another way to, to play with Conda is to use Micromamba. So Micromamba is a very fast and robust package manager that uses Conda repositories. So it has some, some, some extra features, let's say, and some people in the end, they use Micromamba to, to, to interact with Conda repositories instead of using Conda to interact with them. And some people even merge that with the idea of using containers because the idea is that this, this environment solving that's happening right now, it's not guaranteed to, be the, to, to, to give you the same uh, dependency graph, let's say, forever. And people have had experiences when they try to reproduce a Conda environment a while after they, they first tested it and they got it in a different way. So you don't really have this guarantee that 
you will have the same environment in the future or things will work the same way. So what people do is to use uh, Conda, Macromomba, whatever, to do the management of this of these packages to be an easy way to install them somewhere, but you do that inside a container image so that when you have the container image, it's built for you forever. You can run it today or in 10 years, and it's supposed to work the same way. So that's the, the golden practice, the, 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 the best practice, let's say, the gold protocol. Uh, we have again here what we had before, the NVIDIA and what you're going to do is to, work a, to write a Docker file like we did before, but we're not going to use apt-get install. We're going to get the environment YAML, which is the recipe for the, for the, for the, for the Conda environment. We're going to move it inside the container image. We're going to create an environment. We're going to install the package that we want based on this NVIDIA And this is our container image. So it's a container image, which is the best for reproducibility. But all the hassle about installing software and finding dependencies and everything is done with Micromamba, which is very fast and nice and uses the Conda repository, which are great, which is a great repository for bioinformatic tools. So this is the, is the, the gold standard, right? So as you see, it's still installing. Mm, here, there are some instructions on, on how to do exactly what I was describing so far. And even going to the point to to push your your image to uh, container repository here is uh, Docker Hub. But again, this is kind of the hard way. It's really a, a pain to write every container image that you need. There's a project called BioContainers, and BioContainers is very interesting because they have a container ready for you for every package that you have in, in Bioconda. So for FastQC, for example, that we're going to use in a, when we are writing our simple RNA-seq workflow, uh, the proof of concept, we're going to use a few tools like FastQC. And you know, so many people use FastQC. If everyone had to write their Docker file to create their container image to pay to host it somewhere, it would be awful. So Biocontainers already have container images for a lot of different tools. And actually, when you go to to NF Core, to the modules. And again, on the third day, you're going to see this with Chris Hackard. But just to, to show you, when you go to the modules, uh, regardless of the module that you choose, anyone, you will see that there, there's a bio container being used here. So if you want to use this module, uh, the container is already there's a bio container. I could pick any other one as random, you know, Ariba, uh, run, main. And you have a bio container here, as you can see. So these bio containers are a great, very, very, very nice uh, feature. And you can use it to find multi-package images, like an image that has many tools. Sometimes you want to run more than one tool in the, in the same process. Sometimes you want a specific tool. So you have this container images, which contain only one tool, which is FastQC here. And sometimes you have these multi containers with two, three, four, five different tools inside it. Uh, there is this uh, Galaxy Studio tool that is very nice. It, it brings this bullet search program that allows you to find uh, these bullet containers that you are looking for. It's very, very nice. So at the bottom here, we have some exercises uh, that allow us to play with the other scripts that are already written here for us, the script 2.mf, for example, with Docker using the Salmon container created by BioContainers. It's a very nice exercise for you to play with. Then on the bonus exercise, I really, re I really recommend you to like after the training, read everything again in your pace and try to do every exercise. Even the obvious one, try to do it because when you are doing it, you ended up running into something that you thought was trivial and actually it requires some thought. So I really recommend you to, to go through the exercise and, and, and solve them. Here we have another solution. So with that, uh, we finish our, our, our session today. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, feel free to watch it again and pause and go to the channel on the NF course Slack to, to ask your questions, to see what other questions people are asking, to, to discuss whatever you, you, you think is interesting. So if you go to the NF Core website, nf-co.re, you can go to join NF Core. 
on the top here and there's a link for slack so by clicking here it will take you to slack and once you are there you just don't you just join that channel uh, which is september 23 let's go here it's a sept 23 training dash foundational so we will be there to to answer all your questions so the overview uh, of the of the session today was basically how to use Nextflow, how to modify a Nextflow pipeline that you want, how to understand the configuration. So we went to the, the setting up of this Git pod experience. We understood the basic concepts like processes and channels. We saw some images that helped us to understand when you have a channel and with a queue of elements and these elements, they are provided to tasks, which are process instances and processed and then put in the channel again at the end and, and deliver to another process, which is the next step in your pipeline. We saw the idea of execution abstraction, which means that it's very easy to use different compute environments, cloud, cluster, your local laptop. You just tell Nextflow which executor you want to run and Nextflow will do all the work for you. Same thing if you want to use Conda or if you want to use Docker or Singularity or Podman, you just tell Nextflow and it will take care of you, take care of mounting the volumes, doing the configuration, pulling the container image, running the container, setting some uh, parameters for you, setting the right user permissions and all these things. Uh, in the configuration part, we saw lots of things we can, we can do about uh, requesting resources for a specific process or attaching labels to processes. Uh, many different things, right? For deployment scenarios, we saw where we can deploy. So we saw that we can even have something I think is very, very nice, which is this idea of hybrid deployments. I can run a pipeline in my machine. And for most time, things are really light. I don't want to spend money with the cloud, but there's this one annoying process that takes like forever. I really need a lot of resources. So I want this specific one that I attach a label called big task. I want this specific one to run, to run on a WS batch or in the local node and not as a job in a cluster. So it's it's very, very powerful. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time for this foundational training, so I can't show many examples. And everyone, I mean, most people are still very in the beginning of their path in the in the next level learning, let's say. So I, I cannot show things that are very challenging because it can not be very comfortable at the beginning. You may get lost and then in the end, it, it will not be worth it. But the hands-on training, for example, which is the next one, we have a more a closer to a real life example of a pipeline with a lot of different container images and mullet containers and so on. So after that, I really recommend you to take the hands-on training because it's, it's much more interesting. It looks more real. For tomorrow, which is the second session, we are going to get into more detail about what are, what are channels, processes, channel factories, channel operators, uh the cache and resume and at the end we will we will write a simple rnac workflow from scratch so it will still be a simple one so not really close to a real life rnac pipeline but still it will be a pipeline that's real enough to be useful for you it will index a transcriptome file it will perform some quality controls it will perform gene expression quantification it will create a mobile KC report in the end. So it, it's a real pipeline. It, it will work and it's very useful. But usually we need, uh, most of it, in some cases, we need things that are much more complex. So that's the difference that I'm trying to, to point out here. So I don't want to risk to show something that's very complex, even though it's interesting to me, and to lose you because it, it, it's like a, a big jump, right? So I apologize if for some people we are going too slow or too fast. I'm trying to find the balance here. But I think that being able to answer your questions in the channel on Slack, it's, it's an amazing uh, opportunity to try to even tune more this balance. So if someone thought something was very easy here or obvious, you can ask difficult questions there and I will be more than happy to answer. Or if you thought it was too fast here, I would like to emphasize that there are no stupid questions. Every question is welcome from the very basic one to the very complex one. Every question is welcome and we will be more than happy to answer all your questions there. So that leads to the end of the first day of the training material, of the, of the training session. And I look forward to meet you tomorrow. Bye-bye.